Like, okay, yeah, you say all these things, but you don't live in any way consistent with what you claim to be true. And so it really does start with us. And then, you know, I'll pause there because I'm on a bit of a, bit of a rant here. Now. No, that's good. I, it's good. Know, we want to be able to talk back and forth. But I have plenty of other ideas. But that really is the starting point. Are you growing in holiness? Is the love of Jesus transforming your heart and the power of the Holy Spirit? If that's not happening, then we shouldn't even really be talking about mission yet. Hey, I'm here with my friend and co-laborer in the vineyard, Pete Barak, and... Uh, I just want to welcome you to the podcast. I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have today, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Yeah, so you and you and I have, you know, chatted recently, and I saw your OSV talk. And uh, for those who, uh, for those of us um, who haven't seen it. Um, I think this dynamic of, hey, we're not, we know that the data is telling us that we're not quite winning in the church when it comes to young adult ministry, or at least not as a whole, not as, you know, these broad strokes in the church. So we see that from some of the, some of the polls and some of the things like that. Where do you see that taking place the most and sort of how do you assess that situation like what's going on Mm -hmm. yeah and you said that really gently right we're not quite winning i mean actually if you look at any poll look at any data set it's not even just like a oh a gentle decline or like we're leaking people here and there it's it's a pretty much a full-scale cliff uh and it's you could say that that's true for other generations as well but if we're just looking at like let's just say millennials and and gen zers so basically anyone born after 1982 just to keep our terms clear um it's 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 really dramatic it's really dramatic when only about 10 to 15 percent of self-identified Catholic millennials would go to mass on any sort of regular basis and mass being kind of that source and summit of, of the Catholic life, that foundational piece, that behavior that we all know we're supposed to do every week when only about, hmm, you know, let's just call it 13 percent of, of self-identified Catholics are doing that. Uh, that's that's pretty dramatic. I mean, anyone who runs a business, if their primary, if their clients or people who consider themselves clients only about Thirteen percent came to the the, the gym that they're 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 running or bought the the product that they're selling. They'd be out of business. I mean, we are in a full scale crisis. I mean, Pope Benedict called it a crisis of, of discipleship. And so, there's the statistical analysis that we can look at, and it's it's pretty clear. I think what's more dramatic though is when we just look at it from more of an anecdotal stand, standpoint. Like, we all know people who were raised in the faith who no longer believe. And we all have probably people in our immediate nuclear family who were raised and maybe even had a a time when they believed in high school or uh, middle school or something like that, who are now not only living um, detached from the church, but are living lives that are in many ways antithetical to Christian teachings. And um, and not only are they living that way, but they're asking us to support it and and to affirm it. So there's... There's, again, a statistical analysis that I paints one picture, but I think what hits it closer to home is just the fact of, like, just think about your family. Think about your friends. Uh, how many people do you know who were raised in some sort of Christian Catholic environment who are no longer believing? That's pretty dramatic. Yeah, and I think something new is also going, you said, hey, maybe that's happened to generations in the past or whatever, where a whole generation has sort of, like, gone off the cliff. But something, there's something in my from my vantage point, something pretty f- spectacularly terrible is happening too, where <laughs> I know two people, two very different missionary, you know, campus ministry organizations. I know two people from two different ones who have gone through a deconstruction of faith. And these were people I was like, it would never happen to them. It would never happen to them. What happened? You know? And so we have that spectrum. And then we have the people who are like, you know, the, um, I know that bringing them into that, you know, the current Catholic Christian context that they're on, like their chances of my confidence in their chances of being discipled into uh, this deep commitment that Christ calls us to is, is pretty low. You know, like the, the affectivity of that situation feels, feels not great. What, you know, with that, like 
where do we start to think about like moving forward? Like how do we create a, um, even how do we start to plan against that? You know, how do we do, how do we, how do we change? What are you guys seeing on the ground um, on how we can begin to start unraveling this kind of situation? Yeah. I'm glad we're on a podcast because there's plenty of time to unpack this because you're just asking like, only the most important question of my life you know, that I'm <laughs> yeah. other than like, how do I love my wife and children? Well, and love Jesus. This is the thing I, I spend all day thinking about. Uh, and you identified the twofold problem. You have the world, the flesh and the devil that's still as effective as since the garden at stealing souls and hearts from the truth, right? And in some ways, the spirit of the age that has infected our culture, a one of a self-determinism, of a, a moral subjectivity, of a being able to kind of, in order to be, to be free, or in order to be happy, I have to be free. In order to be free, I have to be able to do what I want with whomever I want, whenever I want. And not only that, you have to, like I already said, you have to affirm it, you have to agree with it, you have to celebrate the, the choice I'm making. And I'm not just talking about the sexual revolution. I'm talking about telling the truth. I'm talking about discipline at work. I'm talking about marriages. And there's just, it's, it's infiltrated into every single kind of crack and crevice of society. So you have the world. And in some ways, we shouldn't be surprised by the world, right? Like we shouldn't be scandalized that the world loves sin. I mean, that's just, that's just how things are. That's how things have always been. The world has always been uh, a, a source of temptation for Christians. So we shouldn't be scandalized when the world is the world, I guess is what I'm saying. But I think the, the second part of the problem that you just mentioned is it's, it's quite scandalous that in most places around the world, in most parishes, in most local church communities, the ability to be in the world but not of it, to actually have uh, communities of missionary disciples, as Pope Francis called it, to have environments where somebody can encounter the truth in the person of Jesus Christ, fall in love with him, hear his call to to follow them, to follow him, and like have that metanoia, that conversion experience, where all of a sudden I'm no longer seeing things as the world sees them, but as Jesus sees them, like the new lens, as Pope Benedict called conversion, new sight, receiving new sight. All of a sudden, what was blurry and black and white has become technicolor and clear through the lens of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Like the, the ability for that to happen and then to run in a, a people that celebrates that and supports that and helps you grow to actually have environments where I'm growing in holiness and then getting to the point of being sent out on mission to go make disciples. Like all of that that I'm just describing should be normative in the, in the, the Catholic Church. That's, that's actually who we are. That's what uh, she exists to do, to make disciples. And yet, as you identified you don't feel a whole lot of confidence. And if you actually found a, a young adult who was hungry, where do you send them? Uh, how do you ensure that wherever you're sending them doesn't actually lead them further away? Uh, are they going to make friends? Are they going to have a community that actually fosters everything I just described? Or are they going to get pushed away or kind of plugged into some sort of program or some sort of system that's pretty impersonal that ultimately just wants to produce more volunteers to perpetuate whatever program or system that they just got plugged into? I mean, all of that is is a, uh, a real threat to the fruitfulness that we are called to as the church. And so I think what we're seeing across the board is that, that thing that Jesus said, where the Father is both pruning and cutting off dead branches. What we're seeing in the church is things that are dead are being cut off and thrown into the fire, and things that have the potential for fruitfulness, things that are alive but could be more fruitful, the vine, is being pruned for hopefully, and I, I believe, a season of greater fruitfulness. Remember, the Father only prunes things that are alive. You, you cut off dead branches and throw them away. You prune, you cut back the things that are alive that have the potential for more fruitfulness. And I think that's what we're seeing in the church. So to get to the, the question you asked, though, is like, what's the way forward? I think, um, well, there's a thousand different ways, but I think the, the starting point is, is you and me. And it, it sounds a little cliche, again, of like, What's, what's wrong with the world? Me. I think it was Chesterton or somebody said that, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's kind of cute and could be cross-stitched on a pillow or something. But like, there's actually like a real truth to that. The, the starting point of mission, the starting point of discipleship is like, do I know Jesus? Is he the Lord of my life? Are my time, my talent, and my treasure handed over to the King? Am I growing in holiness every day? Am I opening myself up to the power of the Holy Spirit? Am I allowing the love of Jesus Christ to pour into my heart so that I have 
actually have something to offer. And the reason this is such a profound starting point is our generation has an incredible radar for BS, right? Like we know immediately if something's authentic or not authentic. So we're fooling ourselves if we think we can go out on mission and try to go reach this corrupt and debauched uh, uh, generation if we ourselves aren't authentically living as Catholic Christian disciples. It's like, if our eyes don't change when we say the name of Jesus, if our life looks no different than the rest of the, the secular people that uh, our friends know, then we will not only be um, ignored, we'll be put in this little hypocritical bin and we will be kind of placed there for eternity. Like, okay, yeah, you say all these things, but you don't live in any way consistent with what you claim to be true. And so it really does start with us. And then you know, I'll pause there because I'm on a bit of a bit of a rant here. Now. No, that's good. I, that's know, good. We want to be able to talk back and forth, but I have plenty of other ideas. But that really is the starting point. Are you growing in holiness? Is the love of Jesus transforming your heart in the power of the Holy Spirit? If that's not happening, then we shouldn't even really be talking about mission yet. I mean, it's it's so true. Like I just as you were talking, I was remembering a situation where I found myself in a conversation with you know um, church going men like regular church attending men um, and that I didn't know. And the conversation was, hey, there was four, five people around the table and it just so quickly went to, oh, basically, what do you do? How much do you earn? You know, hmm. and, and all, like very material things, right? And, um, and... I started going, I started to, I tried to shift the conversation to go, Hey, what's, what's your purpose in life? And it was honestly, it was crickets. And I was like, mm. ah, like this is, this is the, the condition that we find ourselves. And not that like I got my purpose, you know, dialed in or whatever. I just, um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that that conversation felt very difficult, even within a group of, of men who are faithfully attending weekly and i was like yeah ah, you know crap like this yeah. is this is bad um yeah and the the conversation that we're talking about like hey what is what does your life look like with jesus in it I, you know i'm i'm blessed to have people i can have that with but i find that it's rare you know it's it's there and i feel like there's a, a heart check in like um how do we have more of those conversations? You know, how, like, what am I doing in order to build that up within the people that are entrusted within the friendships that I have and the people that I have around me? And um, if we start at that point, I do feel like uh, it's all these little ripples that kind of go out, but it, it starts with me and it starts with like, where's my heart at? Where's, um, what is, what, like, can I talk about what Jesus is doing in my life today, this week, yeah. this month, this year, and have a compelling, convincing conversation about it and say, yeah, like I, I see this is what he's doing. That's what he's doing. Um, this is very difficult, but he's doing it. And, uh, and for people to say, yes, okay, let me respond and share, you what, share with you what he's doing for me. So yeah. I don't know, like... Yeah, and what you're describing too is a starting point of identity is so critical to this, to, well, to basically everything. Like when you're at that dinner party and people are talking about what they're doing, there's there's an assumption that we make that people know who they are, like we, we are being precedes our doing, okay? There's a presumption that we make in the church that because people are baptized in a certain degree of catechesis. People know their identity as a son or daughter of God. They know what it means to be the fundamental identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can start to go about what they should do, how they should act, what they should like, what what the what their life should look like. And that's where in the doing, there is a great degree of diversity and a great degree of many one body, many parts, right? We're not all eyes, we're not all hands, we're not all feet. We're all going to do, in some ways, different things for the kingdom to be the, the body of Christ on the earth. But actually, like, our purpose and our identity is remarkably united in the sense that, like, we are all sons and daughters of wrath, 
before our baptism, but through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his pouring out his spirit on us, we are brought from death to life. And now we are sons and daughters of God. We are brought into a new family. We are living a new reality. Our new purpose, which was destined for destruction in hell, ultimately, has been transformed for abundant life here on earth and in heaven. I mean, the old Baltimore Catechism, what's the purpose of life? To love, to know, love, and serve God in this life and the next. Like, that's actually true, you know, for all of us. And how then we live that out is as diverse as each one of us. And that's part of the, the genius and the joy of walking with the Lord is discovering what he's uniquely put in me to live out of this actual kind of, dare I say, common identity. We have a, a common purpose and mission in life. How we then live it out is something that's given to us. And one of the great lies of the age is that, my life, even my identity, who I am, is something I get to curate and to kind of manipulate for myself. I get to walk through life and choose for myself who I really am, as opposed to so. And that's a reaching out and grasping approach, right? I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take what I want for myself and make it who I am. My identity is something I can create for myself, whereas. What we see in scripture, and it starts literally in the garden, when, we, when Adam and Eve reach out and take what was meant to be a gift, everything falls apart. When we are in a posture of receptivity, when we receive our identity, when it's bestowed on us, then all of a sudden everything can flow in right order because it's from the, the proper starting point. And so uh, I think what you find, even in really well-intentioned, faithful Catholics, is they actually don't know their identity. They don't really know what it means to be a son or a daughter of the father and yeah. the promises that come with that and the power that comes with that and the suffering that comes with that and the, the mission that comes, all those elements are, I think too often taken for granted. And then, like I said, then we just default to, well, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And it's not born out of that loving um, familial uh, unity that is really essential to understanding the life of a disciple, the life of the, the, the Christian in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, kind of to re reiterate what you're saying, I've heard it um, described as relationships, identity, mission. And so mm -hmm. we actually were born into relationship. I mean, this is the like the way God made it. Like, I don't, I'm not born an adult. I'm born a tiny little child. And even <laughs> yeah. like as a little baby, I... Our brains aren't developed enough for me to understand who I am. So the connection between a child's eyes and its mother's eyes or father's eyes is like, we're, you know, there's actually like psychological studies that show that I, um, or like tiny little kids, use their parents' brains to understand themselves. Hmm. So by the eye connection. So it's, a, it's like first an emotional connection that says, hey, the way you look at your child um, helps them form who they are. Right. So like yeah. we have these relationships um, of which I understand who I am, you know, and the catechism also says like our, our parents are the first models of God that we receive. Right. That's why we hear right. these things right. like father wounds and, you know, mother wounds and like things like that affect our real relationship with God. Like you try to sit down to pray and you go, oh, man, like just all my stuff from like, what was it like growing up? You know, it just it all yeah. comes in there when we try and like, yeah, you know, like bring ourselves wholeheartedly to to our like the father and so there's relationships and out of those relationships we understand who we are like we hear these beautiful stories about like um tribes in africa who you get a song that your mom sings to you in utero and when you hurt yourself other people learn the song and they sing it to you when you hurt yourself and even when you stray the village knows the song because they know you and you're born into this community of people and they sing that song over mm -hmm. you to correct you back into community. It's like, this is who you are. This is like your unique, um, you've got a spot. It's secure. This is like, you belong, you know, and it's like this, this community. And um, from that, we're like, yeah, this is who I am. And from that point, like, like relationships form identity, and from identity, then I can go and do mission. But mm -hmm. when it's the other way around, it's a disaster. If mm -hmm. I have to find my identity by what I do, it is a freaking mess. 
you know, because then all of a sudden I have to grasp and I have to use people and I have to do that because I need to self-actualize. And I think some of what our generation is feeling, some, not all, I don't want to like just broad stroke everything. This is, this is a little sure. bit of a generalization, but it's not, you know, is in an environment with a lack of authenticity of people who don't understand what we were just talking about, people go, what they're saying is not true. Because I, because I'm not sure I'm convinced by their lives. Because I, I got my BS meter like is super dialed in as a millennial and Gen Z, you know, and I yeah. go, oh, I have to define my own meaning, like, because mm-hmm. I can't, I can't trust the meaning that you're giving me, like I, I can't trust that there's this transcendent order, so I have to like, do that, and I see how ministry is shifting where, over. The course of the last, I don't know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not an expert, like 30, 50 years or whatever, the, our culture has been creating these Christian dots in people, even if they weren't Christian, you know, like there's just enough Christian points where these Christian dots within my heart and good ministry was about connecting those dots and going, Hey, you know, like that, that desire that you feel here is from God and it's. You know, like, here's how it's, like, truly expressed, and this is what brings life and all those kinds of things. I think in, in the broader culture, we're not, we're not actually creating those dots anymore. We've said, hey, everyone, define your own meaning. You know, like, gender, truth, um, all those kinds of things. And, and, and it's leaving us miserable, you know? It mm-hmm. means that, hey, um, and ultimately, I also think it's, like, it, it comes down to, like, if you have power to actualize yourself, then, then it's great. But if you don't, it's terrible. Yeah. And, right. and I think that um, that's the, when, when that, you know, when the kingdom feels like it's this inverted way of the world where blessed are the, um, blessed are, you know, essentially the ones who don't have the mm-hmm. ones who are powerless, the ones who, um, you know, as we see in the Beatitudes, when those things get reversed and flipped, uh, well, those things flip the world upside down. When we live out of that, that's a transformation of the world. And we saw that in the Roman Empire where slaves and in, in that society, women, like were elevated into in yeah. the kingdom. Um, it's radically transformative and it doesn't require me to find happiness by finding my own meaning, overpowering you and, and all sorts of things like that. So I don't know, re- yeah, relationships that any reason. Yeah. Irony, like the great dichotomy of if you lose yourself for my sake, you will find it. If you want to be first, you need to be last. Uh, it, it, there's all these moments of like actually receiving your identity and submitting your will to the will of the father to in an act of faith saying like, okay, you're God and I'm not. And I'm going to say yes to that. In humility, I'm going to receive from you the truth about who I am, what I'm made for, and the pathway to fulfillment. By doing it that way, we actually become more fulfilled, more free, more who we want to be. And actually society in submitting collectively to a, a worldview given to us, revealed to us, as opposed to manufactured by ourselves, we treat our we treat each other better. We actually have the the a closer to the utopia, so to speak. I don't like that that phraseology, right. but we have a a more just, more righteous, more loving society. In, inversely, when we we manufacture for ourselves what is true and who we are, and what it leads to enslave we, we become enslaved to our passions we come, become enslaved to our desires and into that whatever worldview we've constructed for ourselves and it's very lacking and then when you blow it up to the societal level when everybody is basically free to choose their own adventure it then really just becomes the, the survival of the fittest whoever strongest is going to determine what is true even in while they say everyone is welcome while they say everything is is valid it's it doesn't play out that way because as soon as it's a conflicting worldview 
who's to say who's right? Well, the only way to determine who's right is who's stronger, who can shut the other person up. And so a society becomes less open, less full of dialogue, less diverse, actually, and more um, restrictive of the creativity and robustness of the, the human experience. And so uh, it's it's one of those Christian dichotomies that at face value is like, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's actually true, but then when you look at the course of human history, and and then even just in your own heart, um, it really plays out that way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I mean, you see tribalism happening too, right? Like, yeah, so I, totally, I have to find my people that I'm safe with because you're either safe or you're not safe, and there's like kind of no room in between, which just feels so crazy. And um, you know, obviously going through a pandemic where the stress level amongst every person in the world just goes up because you got to figure out how to deal with reality. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, you know, it's um, yeah. Right. So, okay. So we got this, but hold on. Can I make a point about tribes? Cause I think this is a really important just like concept is, um, human beings are designed to live in tribes. Like we thrive in a tribal environment in the sense that like, the nuclear family experiment, which is a largely Western kind of idea of along the lines of what we're talking about, where everything sufficient for human flourishing is like husband and wife, and that's it. We're going to live in this little suburban town. We're going to kind of go about our own way and like all that, like has proven basically not to work very well. When when humans thrive is when we're with an extended family size unit, a, a tribe that has a, a mission to accomplish, and therefore everyone knows how to play their role in the service of that mission. And early tribes were about survival. But even if the mission is just we need to survive, at least then everybody knows I'm the I'm the hunter. I'm the the I'm the one who makes the houses. I'm the one who does this. I'm the, and there's a unity in a, it's, you know, the adage, it takes a village to raise somebody. It's, it's actually true. It takes a village to raise somebody. It takes a village to disciple somebody. Where it goes wrong is where you say like tribalism, where my tribe is against your tribe. And what was so radical about the Christian tribe that emerged was it wasn't tribalistic. It was actually like open to everyone. Now, any tribe in any community still needs a membrane, right? There still needs to be able to be able to say like, oh yes, you're in or you're not. The difference about the Christian membrane was like, you could come through it. And not only could you come through it, we we want you to come through it. It doesn't, but you're still coming through it on the terms of the tribe. You're still, in order to be part of the Christian tribe, this is what it means to be a part of it. Kind of unapologetically, like this, we believe these things about Jesus and we believe these rituals are important, you know, like all that type of stuff. And so in an effort to be kind of welcoming or in an effort to be self-determinist or in an effort to be, um, in an effort to come against uh, evil tribalism, which leads to war and all this, society has tried to kind of pop all those bubbles. And that's that's not healthy either. So part of what I think the new Christian experiment moving forward, the new model of ministry is reconstructing the proper understanding of the Christian tribal life, this extended family on mission of people of God on the move that isn't so small that it kind of doesn't have any dynamism, or it's so big that you're anonymous. It's that medium-sized group that uh, I heard somebody say once, it's, it's small enough to care, but big enough to dare small enough to care about you and know you, but big enough to dare big dreams. That's what a proper tribe feels like. And that's where human beings thrive. And I think that's actually a, a model for us moving forward. So I yeah. don't know where you wanted to go next, but I had to say that you brought up no, tribe. No, that's, I, I get I excited like that's, about that stuff. I, yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm totally with you on the whole idea of, yeah, we need extended community or tribes, you know, and and we need to find our place. Like I've been made with giftings, callings, like all those kinds of things where I, where I can sure. do that. So who are my extended group of people? Because here's, here's the thing I know, like I, I'm not enough for my kids. You know, yeah. I got five kids. Like my reflection of God, the father is totally insufficient. You know, obviously that's the understatement of the podcast, but <laughs> Like if you take the understatement out, it's like, man, I, I want my kids to have a Pete around, you know, because mm-hmm. you're going to reflect a part in how you're made about who God is that I can't, you know? And so I have these other, like in this case, like guys around my kids who are like Uncle Robbie and Uncle Pierre and like these other guys who are like, you know, who reflect God's heart in a way that I just can't, you know? Yep. 
And yeah. they, and when my kids watch my interaction with them, um, like my men's group, they can see, oh, like, like this guy brings something out of, you know, my dad that is different from what I can just bring out of him. Like they have capacity to draw different stuff out, uh, out of us. And that makes everything better. You know? Yeah, totally. It, it makes yeah. better. And, and I'm a product of that. Like I can, growing up, I can think of at least 30 different men who cared about my spiritual life growing up. And mm-hmm. this was not something that accidentally happened. This was a, a concerted scheme of my parents and all of my parents' friends where they gave each other permission to speak into my life. So I would go over to the, the Cress's house, the Herbeck's house, the Rolf's house, the Macari's house, the Chocolate's house, you name it. And we'd be sitting there watching football or whatever. And Mr. Rolf would look at me and say, like, hey, Pete, how's basketball going? And I'd tell him, and then he'd say, like, Pete, oh, good. Well, what's Jesus doing in your life? And that wasn't, like, weird or unusual. It was a little annoying as a 13-year-old boy. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, right? But what it demonstrated to me was, like, what my mom and dad believed was replicated in these other men that I really admired and respected and wanted to be like. And it took it from just like, oh, it's just, you know, because when your parents believe something, you love your parents, you respect your parents or whatever, but it's still like your parents, you know? So if they if they believe something, you're kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's just kind of the way dad is. But when it's replicated in all of your father's friends and those those friends of his are care about you and are investing in you and discipling you, that's an incredibly powerful thing. And I mean, no joke, I'm definitely not... A faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I can. I think I can say this with full sincerity. I am not here today without uh, those men caring about me and discipling me through those really, really formative years. And yeah, I feel like a lot, a lot of people listening to this are going to be super jealous. You know, in yeah. in, in yeah. the holiest kind of way. And but at the same time, I didn't have that that experience growing up. But the father provided fathers for me when I needed them. You know, so this is sure. not like a hopeless thing. And to kind of transition, I feel like, yeah, like we've got this like overall painting of like culture and, you know, the state in the church and like where we're at, you know, coming to this idea of modernity. And there there's these conversations going from uh, that book that's really popular um, and rightfully so from Christendom to apostolic mission. And we we understand we've gone through this massive technological shift like I think we, I think we get all that, you know, and yeah. we got, we got into this, um, tribe versus tribalism and like all those things are good. So now what do we do? You know, how does this, how does this actually roll out? So if, if there, if there's a pastor, um, or a youth minister or, um, some sort of community leader that's going, yeah, you know, like, I want to be able to be there for this generation. Mm -hmm. I want to be there for my brothers and sisters who are struggling with the faith. What, what do we do? You know, what are the principles? Where do we start? Um, How do we, yeah. How do we, you know, again, start to unravel this in, in the day to day. Yeah. I was recently reading something about uh, mission and I honestly can't remember where I read it, but it, the the author was comparing the incarnation to mission. And hear me out for a second. He was he was drawing this this really important principle of what we see in Jesus in his incarnation is God, you know, sends the Son Jesus on on mission to the world. Obviously, for all of us, in a much broader mission than any of us individually are called to. But the, the the point he was trying to make was. The incarnation of Jesus reveals something to us about mission in that he came at a particular time, in a particular place, to a particular people, and lived a particular way of life in order to accomplish the mission the Father put before him. And so what we see in the incarnation is Jesus actually came in this this moment in time in Palestine, right, as a Jew, lived a very pretty faithful Jewish life, and was ministering to a very specific group of people. He wasn't actually, you know, the incarnation didn't happen in the 18th century France or 13th century China, or it was, it was a particular time and place in order to accomplish a much broader mission for all of us, a much broader solution for all of us. But it started in this one kind of niched down moment 
with a kind of a very specific group of people. And I think that's really important as a starting point when we think about mission is like, who are we called to incarnate with? Who are we called to bring Jesus to by incarnating with them, living with a very particular group of people in a particular time, in a particular way of life? If, if you haven't kind of discerned that with the Lord, then I'm guessing mission has remained too vague, too nebulous, too out there for you to actually do anything about it. When we think about evangelization, it's just like, oh, I have to go out and go do something. I have to go start something. I have to go find um, kind of a way to generate something out there. We're really missing the point. It's, it's not, evangelization is not something I have to go find out there. It's, I have to live my life faithfully, in, in, in great humility and, and holiness and, and consistency with the will of God for, for my life. And as I go through my life, I need to have the eyes of the Spirit to see what is Jesus already doing in the places that he's calling me to? What is, where is he already working? I want to go cooperate with him in that. So when I enter into a restaurant or a relationship or a, a, a workplace or whatever, I'm not called to necessarily generate something. I'm called to say, what is God already doing here in the hearts of these people? I want to cooperate with that, and I want to incarnate Jesus with them. I want to be able to live in the proper ways, the life that they're living, so that we have genuine interaction, so that we I can bear witness to how it looks like we're living the same life, but there's something deeper that I'm uh, living in and through, and his name is Jesus, and I want to invite you to consider that as well. So the starting point in the, the what do we do is to start to receive from the Lord a vision of who do you who are you sent to? Who is he preparing you, uh, preparing for you to go to and to be him? You know, my favorite definition of a disciple is living as Jesus would live if he were you. That was pretty good. I'm going to say it again. Living as Jesus would live if he were you. And Jesus lived in a particular time and a particular rhythm of life with the, the, his disciples and the, the Jews that he was living with. We're called to do the same thing. And so uh, instead of thinking about it like I got to go start young adult ministry or I got to go figure out a way to become a friend with a young adult, like what if you thought about it more along the lines of like I need to go be Jesus everywhere and in living that Jesus life everywhere, I'm going to be aware of what the Holy Spirit is starting to generate. I'm going to cooperate and I'm going to participate in whatever I see the Holy Spirit doing. And I'm going to um, maybe even start with the people who already like you. You know, like what if we, instead of trying to go out and kind of find the, the, the fringes of the people that, you know, are going to spit in our face, which we always think is going to happen, which like never actually happens in evangelization, like fun fact, other than maybe like in China or something like that right now. But we live around this fear of like getting real persecution. Like it's not right. happening, people. Like you can talk about Jesus and most of the time people are just either going to ignore you, listen to you respectfully, or like that's about it. Like there's not a whole lot of real ramifications right now. But um, the point is, what if we actually just said, like, who are the people that like to be around you already? Mm. Start with them. Start to, to kind of manifest and incarnate Jesus in, in those relationships and, and start to see what happens to see what the Holy Spirit has to do. The key, though, in all of this, Jason, is like the awareness of all of what I'm describing, the ability to lead people in this and to articulate this to our communities and to the people uh, in our parishes and all that really fundamentally starts with what we would call spirit-filled leadership. That what you see in the ministry of Jesus, he incarnates in a particular group of people, but then he starts to invest in, in real human beings. Uh, he calls the 12. He identifies three within the 12 to pour into in an even deeper way. He raises up one to be over the head of the 12. At one point, he has a random group of 70. That's like, where did they come from when he sends them off two by two? At the end, there's, you know, 500 or so that hear the Great Commission. So there's this varying size groups of people that receive very different um, formation from him. But Jesus is constantly trying to replicate his DNA in the men and women that follow him. So that by the time Pentecost happens, what is emerges out of the upper room are people who have been trained in the life, the Jesus life, and then now are empowered to go live it. And I think the fundamental wound that we have in the church right now is we just don't have enough spirit-filled leaders. We don't have enough men and women who are trying to live as Jesus would live if he were them, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and really truly learning how to lead in and through that reality. Yeah, you that was know, a long answer. No, it's I good. Touched on a lot of things. Yeah, I'm going to go back to one of the first things you said. Is um, I had this experience. Uh, we had four kids, and um, like, there's always this part of me that 
you know, I want to go for it. And I, I had the very, like, I have to go for it. I have to go, like, out there and build the kingdom. You know, like, that's yeah. kind of, like, and uh, in the most beautiful, providential way, like, we had four kids at the time, and I still I still was kind of operating on, oh, gee, you know, I just got to, I'm going to, you know, I was, I was checking some pretty good boxes, you know, being a good dad, being a good husband, like, you know, doing, doing ministry, helping ministry people do more ministry and like all those kinds of things. And I was like, ah, oh, just like, and, um, and then we, you know, through the miracle of NFP, like had, had our fifth and it, it, it was like phenomenal. There's like a massive story to that, that, you know, I'll, sh- I'll share with you over, um, a bourbon sometime in person, <laughs> but in that going, ah, oh, you know, this is the end of my capacity. And I, I felt mm. the Lord say like, no, this is like, where, where does, where should the kingdom be built? And if it's not being built in my home first or in my like first principal place, like the place that I'm incarnated uh, to the, to the, at the first spot, how, how can I go do it anywhere? How can I, how can I go do it anywhere else? And I think that that was like just a, it was so freeing because I felt like, um, and this is almost never from the Lord, it's like, I just got to work harder, you know, right. with, the, with the new reality. And I feel like that, you know, that's, that's never from, um, from the Lord. So if you're in ministry and you're feeling like, yeah, yeah, I just got to, um, I just got to work harder. That's, that's not yeah. what he's, you know, saying. I think yeah. it's like, how do I, how do I trust more? And how is it yeah. less about me and more about where I am? And, and then as you kept, as you kept talking, I was like, oh, yeah, the um, one person described the ministry part and as where do you have a holy discontent with the world mm-hmm. around you? You know, because you're going to see gaps in the kingdom that I don't see. And I'm going to see gaps in the kingdom that you don't see. And it's those gaps that irritate us to no end. That is a way that, you know, Jesus is calling us into filling that gap, you know, and, you know, as we like, and, and I agree. And starting with, um, I'm going to backtrack. I, I believe in, in, in what I've seen in, in these ministries across, um, you know, across a wide array of different types of ministries, the Holy Spirit almost has a linear plan for those for the, like for the fruit, um, where this thing was done here and then you see all these other things, but then it's like, this thing happens and you're like, Whoa, that's, you know, and I, I see this. So yeah, what we do is kind of try and hear people's stories so that we go, Oh, this, there's a, there's a salvation history that the Holy spirit is working out in a very beautiful and profound way. Um, and I think that when we come into a context of saying, what does the ministry of these people need? We can almost say, oh, where has the Holy Spirit, what's the story that's been unfolding here? And Mm -hmm. doubling down on what the Holy Spirit is doing is by far the best strategy that I've ever, you know, like I I get paid for strategy. And, And I used to come to it and say, oh, like, how can I be super smart about like unveiling this thing? And it, right. it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you're trying to uh, build spiritual things. Instead, if you say, what is the spirit doing and how do we double down on that? And then it's just how do just get out of the way, you know, be mm-hmm. there, be present, be docile, and then let the Lord do his thing has been a pretty, pretty powerful shift from those two things, like where, where he's building, who he's, you know, who he's building with and how he's building our, our, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm enriched by uh, you kind of starting at that point in those principles. So then, where do you go yeah, from I mean, there? Yeah, right. Well, and two things can be true at once, right? Like, it's uh, there's no question that's that, that Jordan Peterson thing. Like, you want to change the world, make your bed. Like, it's not a, it's not actually an either or. Like, you should both make your bed and go out and change the world. Uh, you should both disciple and transform your family in the image of the the holy family and respond to whatever way the lord's calling you to go out and do the same in the world um 
it's but it's a very western kind of uh capitalist almost mindset of like in order to really be who i'm supposed to be i have to be recognized for it um it has to be big it has to be growing has to be scalable you know has to be transferable uh and the the principles of the gospel apply to every person for all time in every culture in in every environment like the core of what we believe is not for is for everyone right but everybody's the way the lord calls us into mission the way the lord calls us to live is not necessarily like something that should be scaled or should be transferred or should be promoted even i mean the fact is like saint therese is the patron of of missions and she didn't basically leave the convent right so how does that work like but that doesn't mean what she was doing was better mission than St. Francis Xavier, who basically baptized more people than anyone in human history. Like both are of value, both are good. But what you see in both of them is it's still a starting point of their identity, like we talked about, and from a cup that's overflowing, as opposed to this kind of what we often see in the churches, we're actually scraping the bottle of the barrel in an effort to do more, to serve more, to be more, and instead of being able to let that flow from abundance. And so somebody listening to this who's very practical and very much looking for like a, a tips is going to say like, guys, you're still not given practicals. You're still not telling me like what the next step is. And I would actually argue that like, no, there is nothing more practical than your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're saying, well, that's still not practical. It's like, well, then, then we're then we're having a different conversation. If if when I'm saying that we need to grow in your own relationship and love of the Lord, and it's not clear how to do that, well, great, we can have a conversation about what it means to pray every day and to be a frequent receiver of the sacraments and to grow in virtue and all that type of stuff. But we're, what we're trying to do, I think, in this podcast is to come against the uh, expectation that the solution to what we're facing is basically some sort of boxed offering that actually the solution to what we're facing is not the practicals it's the principles can we all start to live the principles because if we start to in in embody the principles of the gospel in the these core things that we we kind of quickly jump over again to get to the practicals but as soon as we quickly jump over them we're then already not going to be doing the right practical things for the solution that we all claim to to want and be striving for and so it's it's not a cop out on our part to just keep hammering home these principles because until they're truly ingrained in our heart mind and soul the practicals a won't make sense and b won't be nearly as as fruitful and c will be somebody else's practicals that may or may not apply to your situation the principles do but the practicals might not so anytime there's a, more of a turnkey solution oh just do this this and this and this and you'll see the fruit that you're longing for i get really skittish i break out in hives not literally but figuratively in my soul it's just like Three no times. that that how can you say that you know where our church is too big our people are too diverse to just say that this is the solution um if it if if the solution is grounded in the the how and not the why first yeah Here's an analogy for that. Um, I love fishing, and I kind of got into it way late in life. Like, and it was a total okay. invitation from from God. And I would go and I'd, you know, up here in the area we float fish, and so um, you'd see these guys. Are you fly fishing? No, it's like uh, it's float fishing. So there's like a bobber, and then oh, okay. when the you fish bites, like, it, so you're are you sitting on the water or are you walking down the stream? Uh, yeah, you're standing on the side of the river. Um, okay, and so. These guys who are proficient, like you've got the exact same setup as them, okay? Yeah, yeah. And they're going and like they're catching fish, and you're like, okay, show me everything on your like. What are you doing? Like all those kinds of things. But um, and you're like, you try to do it, nothing. They do it, fish, and Man. you're like, yeah, yeah. It's maddening, Son you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think what we're trying to say is like. Look, the principle is you need to learn how to what the fish are doing and what the water's doing. It's not about like my setup. You know, like mm -hmm. you can copy my setup and you might even like float it through the same thing and get lucky and get a fish, right? Right. But actually if I teach you the principles of fishing, 
you can adjust your own setup. Like it'll, it'll change and it'll change from situation to situation. It'll change day to day in the same spot. And that's, I think what, what we're speaking to is saying, look, I don't, I don't want you to t- tell you how to set up your fishing gear. I want you to right. teach you the nature of fishing. And, right. um, and of course it's, you know, so it's kind of a biblical analogy of like where the fish are going to be and throw the nets out and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, well done. Um, yeah, brownie points. Yeah, um, yeah. but but to the, but the, yeah. to, to take this analogy another step further, like it doesn't mean I'm not saying that there still aren't best practices. That like if you don't have the right bait, it, even though you know how to fish, it's still going to be hard to catch a fish. It's but how how do you get to that point? Somebody who just walks up to the river and has all the the equipment, but has no idea why they're there, how it's going to work, what's go, all the elements you talked about. Uh, again, might get lucky, but there's not going to be that kind of fruitful, consistent landing of fish. At the same time, if you know everything there is to know about fishing, and you've read every book, and you've th- you've studied, and you've watched people, but you a have never gotten in the river and tried it, which is another thing we do in mission all the time: is we learn about mission, we think about mission, we watch people on mission, and we don't ever do it. And the thing is, you don't know how to do something until you start to do it. That's one. That's one way. Or if you've you've learned about it. But you then don't pay attention to actually the best bait in this moment is this thing there is that doesn't mean best practices don't have value. It's just at what stage in the process, what stage in your own heart and mindset are those introduced? And again, too often we're looking for the best practices as a, um, a quick fix, a microwave solution to a challenge and a problem that is so much deeper than what the best practices are even, even when they are truly best practices. Uh, they're only best practices if they, because they were born out of somebody going through the proper process. What's, I mean, what's the best way to learn how to fish is to go and be discipled by a fisherman, yeah, exactly. you know, like on right. the river. And then eventually you figure it out, like, because that person's going, Oh, here's, here's what's happening. And, um, yeah. And, we talked about, you talked about like this temptation f- to figure out how to scale and things like that. Man, the, the best relationships that have influenced me the most in my life and have dramatically changed my spiritual journey, they're not scalable. I, I can't replicate my relationship with Jake, you know, and, and these other men who have, uh, you know, been in my, in my life and women and things. I can't, I can't, I can't scale that. I can't put that in a box and unpack it for you. But they can say, hey, read this book, and the book kind of scales, you know, but I think then we look at it and say, hey, the book or the program or the thing like that, um, if, if, I'm, if they're not there with me to kind of unpack that and to sh- say, you need this book at this time or this thing at this time, like I read right. St. John of the Cross way too early in my spiritual journey because I was like, hey, like what are the best books to read? And it's just like... You know, yeah. and it's like, I just you, you crush it, and then you're like, "Well, that sounds pretty terrible," you know. Yeah, and it was right. actually no it, thanks, you know, no thank you. Uh, and and I also, you know, culturally, it was it was difficult to understand too. And but and I'm tasting a glimpse of what that looks like further down the road, you know, uh, mm-hmm. two decades later, and and going, oh, oh yeah, yeah that doesn't sound quite as crazy as it did the first time, but it doesn't scale. Um, yeah. And I think like, I love the idea of saying, Hey, we're going to be relentless and, uh, and, and hold the ground of saying, look, it's not about a program, you know? Right. And it's not about eliminating programs either, but it's not like no program is a, is a magic bullet that or silver bullet that just um will solve your young adult problem I, I even hear through this conversation is even thinking of it in terms of a young adult like issue yeah. Is, yeah. is almost antithetical to what we're saying it's how do we have a relationship how do we solve this relationship dynamic that changes the world that we're trying to to speak into and to to uh, to build the kingdom in. Yep. Yeah. And that's where we would say like, 
our mission is to form young adults into intentional disciples. Our beating heart is we're hungry for the hungry. We're trying to have everyone in our generation meet Jesus, fall in love with him, begin to share him with others. The core wound, though, the starting point of that is actually leadership formation. Like to, like, to your point, like relationships and all of, all of what we're describing to me are a function of can leaders um, produce in others this whole framework? Can you provide environments where this is happening? And by environments, immediately everyone thinks events. I'm not talking about events. I'm talking about life on life, life in community, life on mission. Um, the thing the thing that's so interesting is uh, we, we just, we really have a hard time as a church of like holding two things in balance uh, where we can say unequivocally that programs and events have a purpose and can produce real fruit. At the same time, if they become the thing we're serving, if all of our people are at the service of a program and event, even though it might produce some fruit, it's 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 out of whack. Like, so it's it's not enough to just be like, oh, we don't need programs and events. Like, no, Jesus had events. The Sermon on the Mount was an event. Okay, like that's okay. It's okay to have big moments, but those big moments were at the service of people. And in a lot in large ways, the the people he was most closely investing in, the 12, the three, the, the the 70, that kind of that tribe that he had built around him as he went through his earthly ministry. So we need to be like unequivocally like passionate about the growth of the individual, the real people in our communities and in our in our churches. And in serving them and helping them grow, we need to occasionally put on an event or put them through a program in order to help them take a step, but always at the service of them. Like and human connection is is scalable in the sense that the church has gone all over the world. Like there's no question about the the potential size of a movement, the potential size of an idea, the potential size of this growing community of this people of God on the move, right? But it's still what makes it radical is like, yeah, we're about the masses, everybody coming to know Jesus. But in order for everyone to know Jesus, the individual has to know Jesus. And we're committed to the to the one. We are excited about the 99 but we never lose focus on the one. And so somehow as leaders being able to maintain a balance of great, big vision, scalable, let's reach the world. But I, but I never lose sight of the one. And I love programs. I love events. I love things that just give people a vision for where to go preaching and teaching and let's go. And, but how is that serving the people that I'm, I'm running with? They, both things can be true at once. And, we just too often kind of overbalance ourselves and then correct in the in too much of an extreme in the other way. Yeah, I feel. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot too. Is uh, there's this, there's a saying, uh, "Think steps, not programs." You know, and I think hmm. I think that's true, yeah. and it's and it's helpful. Like, how how does an individual take a step? I think if we push that even further, we need to think experiences. And not and not those and not those things. And what what is an experience? An experience is how I what I come into an environment with and what I leave, you know, that environment with. And uh, like what you're describing about like the three, you know, the inner circle, the twelve, the seventy, you know, all those things. I think is a lot of people are coming into those environments with very different experiences. And so we need to be able to say, "Hey, how do how do we change the overall experience of something um, in order to do that?" But just just being able to like open our minds and say, "Oh, experience. So it's emotional, physical, mental. Like mm-hmm. like we can think differently, and we can actually think think more practical." And I feel like if we pair that with the idea and what you're doing, is the kingdom grows in littleness, and it kind of always has, you yeah, know, like. Right. Uh, people who have made themselves small, God has worked profoundly through. And the littleness is like, yeah, relationally one-to-one. And I know that feels like just totally oversaid and, you know, um, but littleness seems to be like part of God's heart. And, you know, I don't know why, you know, but slowness seems to be another part of his heart. Like he, he, he goes at his pace and um, it's, not the pace I want to go. It's always slower. Uh, 
And I feel like for us to give permission to slow down in order to catch up to God, I, I, I feel like there's just something, something there. And yes, we can put effort into these things. And, um, but I'm, we're not the principal agents of evangelization, you know, like I don't want to run ahead of the Lord anymore. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do those things. So experiences, littleness, slowness, those feel, you know, I was a youth minister for, you know, six years and no one said that to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, right. uh, also, I wasn't taught belong, believe, behave, which is, you know, another thing where it's like, yeah. I was like, oh, shoot. Some of these kids are living lives that are not consistent with the church. Like, I just need to catechize them. And at that time, it was like, there was just not enough content. So immediately I went to, we just need to like get content that, that, that does that. And at the time, I don't know if you're around for this, but NUMA was like the only thing available where it kind of reshaped like these, this understand. <laughs> yeah, you, you were around, I can tell. So, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. uh, the, yeah. The, so the best of times, they were the worst of times. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, and I feel like, oh yeah, I, content is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution, you know? Um, right. And so we say, no, I mean, we, we need content. We absolutely need content. But again, what is it at the service of? And who's who's wielding the content? I love that you said um, experiences. Another word we've been using that I think ties into this that um, resonates with people is a story, being brought into a story, a grand narrative. Um, not only, again, your own personal story, but the narrative that is revealed to us through scripture and through the tradition of the church, this this meta narrative that we're, we're living in, that the world has by and large rejected the Christian meta narrative, but that when you can help people start to kind of live the story of God, when his plan becomes your story, all of a sudden that that is a massively transforming agent with within your life. And, and our generation resonates with experience and story more than um, product or, or even event. Not that events, again, don't have these components, um, but the more the, the program and event can feel like being drawn into a narrative, being drawn into an experience, being, being, able to share my story, receive other people's stories and have those stories be kind of grounded in a bigger story. Um, that really, that, that resonates. Yeah. With and the, kind of the modern mind. Yeah. And, um, one thing is super, I did a whole, like a podcast that hasn't come out yet. I just did a, a whole episode on story with Heather Kim. So Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can do a little great. pitch for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, so so we talked about story um, a lot last week, but but this this idea of when you're watching a story, you actually have to understand the genre, and mm -hmm. if somebody's telling a story, it can actually shape the genre that it's being told in, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm watching a fantasy um, movie, or if I'm watching like a documentary, those things are different. So when I hear your story, mm -hmm. I'm we live in a world that doesn't come genre, genre obvious, right? So as I start to tell my story, I can, we can actually shift the genre of reality that's in somebody's mind, right? Because mm -hmm. we just, we're, in some ways, the battle that we're on is two different genres. The one genre is like, there is no God in this world. You define your own meaning, like this is kind of coming full circle. But, and, yeah. and here's how I've navigated myself in that world. The other genre that, and I think this is like evangelization is a genre shifting storytelling where we say, how do I, how do I tell my story in the context of actually changing what you believe is true about reality? And that's an experience. And that's like, I can, I can tell people the, the, you know, the depths of my heart in, in littleness, smallness, and like sometimes it's scale, like as it's appropriate, but Ah, we just need more of that, you know, dude. Dude, you're. Have you leveraged that definition of evangelization before? Like that is no, that's really just, good. Uh, the, that is that is fantastic. I like. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna attribute that to you at some point. But the, the genre shifting storytelling. Yeah, that's. I got to think about that one for a little bit more. That 
you know, it broke my brain. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad it did. I, I got to say, uh, I probably thought about it before, but I've never expressed it in those terms. So you're bringing out the best Dang. in me. So it's good. It's really good. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's true. Like when you and I talk to people, you know, in our lives, I, I let me, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I got my haircut by this guy that I haven't got my haircut before, you know, several haircuts ago. So don't, you know, and we're talking and he says, what do you do for work? And I'm like, uh, classic, <laughs> you know, I'm like there's two ways to answer this. It, like, oh, I'm in a, you know, we, we develop software, whatever. And then, so I kind of said, oh, you, you know, I gave the, the non-faithful dancer first. And he's like, okay, well, like, who are your clients? And I'm like, okay, Jesus, it's go time. So I explained <laughs> yeah. and I said, you know what? I'm going to tell you something that sounds like I've seen unicorns and I understand that you might not be able to, you know, wrap, wrap your head around, but we, we develop, you know, um, a lot of things for the church to help unlock people's un unlock their ministry potential. And I'm really aware that like I've encountered God and he's like a real dad to me. And I know that that can sound like I've seen unicorns or aliens and I'm coming back and, and I understand that you might be perceiving this as crazy, but here it is, you know, this is, this is the life I live. And he, you know, he speaks to me and like all those kind of stuff. And it's, it was it's massively surprising how the guy goes, oh, you know what? Like my judo instructor and this guy's like big fit dude. He's like, he's a Christian too. And he's been telling me the same thing. And, and I'm mm -hmm. like, you can see in the guy, like I see the world story in this and I'm wrestling with this. And then I see you guys are like saying, no, this is, this is, this is the genre. And as soon as we, we jump into that. Um, the next question I find in this whole genre shift is, oh, the f God, the father's heart is on trial because yeah. if this is true, if, if we've done this genre shift, then I have to like, there's, there's things that have happened in my life that I can't explain in a good way. Like how is God loving and things like that? And that question is everywhere. Yeah. And once we can start saying, look, I know uh, suffering is real, but it's part of, um, we have answers to all the questions that emerge from there. It's just getting into the conversation to some degree. Uh, we're just doing, doing badly. Yeah. I had a similar experience. We had, uh, we have neighbors who are just wonderful people. They've grown to be very, very good friends. And uh, they're in our backyard all the time with their daughter playing with our kids and everything. And um, at one point, when we were first getting to know each other, uh, the wife looked at me and said, you know, like, what do you do? Classic, you know, and uh, I love that question, because it's, it's just like a doorway into making them uncomfortable. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just said, you know, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a Catholic missionary we work in a Catholic nonprofit doing work all over the world, but specifically I help run our young adult outreach to helping parishes reach young adults, right? Kind of a standard answer. And, and <clears throat> we talked about that for a minute. And then, and then she asked like one of the most beautiful follow-up questions that I hadn't really gotten very often, but she said, well, well, why do you do it? You know, like, why, why are you involved in this? And it was like, oh, what a great question, you know? And I, I sat there for a second and I said, I'm, and I, I said to her, like, I know why, but I'm trying to think of how best to say this, you know, in a way that is honoring of you and your experience and kind of where you believe and all that. And I just said, you know what, ultimately I do this because I believe it's true. Like, I actually believe that Jesus died for my sins, and that I have the hope of eternal life in him. And that if I, if I, I walk with him at the end of my life, it's not over. I have a, a new life in him and in the father, son, and Holy spirit. And I just like, yeah, I, and I just kind of paused and I was like, yeah, I just like, I really believe it. And it was this really cool moment because she was like, cool. That's awesome. And what's interesting about the modern mind is they, they actually tend to respect conviction, even when it, makes them uncomfortable, even when it, it could very much come against kind of the, the worldview, there is an underlying respect of like, well, 
I'm, I'm happy for you in some ways that you found something you really believe in, you know, but it was, but, but it's been really interesting is the follow-up conversations where it sparked something in her from her childhood where she's, she's kind of back on a journey of like that type of conviction where, and she's can't wait to talk to me about it because she knows like, I just, I just want to hear her story and love her in the midst of it. And I'm going to share what I believe, but I want to hear what she believes in the process of this. And the Lord is doing something in that dynamic that kind of just started from a very, like you said, a genre shift. All of a sudden, both of us agreed to start to view the world from the lens that what if God is real? Because I believe it, I'm already there. But because I was willing to share that with her, she was willing to, if for, for these conversations at least, step into that reality with me. And it starts to percolate something in her. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a really gentle but um, productive way of, of having these types of evangelistic conversations. Man. Pete, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, but <laughs> yeah, our time yeah. is, is kind of running out here. So leaving it on that note of, you know, the the sharing of Jesus with somebody else is, is I think, an, an appropriate as any place to, to end. So for sure, if if people want to hear a little bit more about what you're doing and um, kind of follow follow how you're uh, navigating this this new new world, uh, where can they where can they follow you, find you, uh, hear more about what you're up to? Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you can find us on any of the social platforms. We're Intentional Disciples or ID. Uh, you can find us there. Um, our website is intentionaldisciples.com. If you want to kind of connect with me more personally, you can find me on Instagram at Pete Burak. Um, I have a podcast. It's called The Hour. You'll probably have to search The Hour uh, Renewal Ministries, because that's the, the governing organization that we are a part of. Uh, if you want to know more about Renewal Ministries, you can go to renewalministries.net. Um, it's not that hard to find us. Just search ID, or our old name was ID916. Nobody could remember the numbers, so we dropped the numbers. But uh, ID916, and uh, yeah, I'd love to connect in any one of our favorite things to do kind of at the core of our ministry is having conversations with people. We want to just like, we want to talk to people about what's going on in them and what the Lord's uh, showing them. And so we'd love to schedule a call and spend some time talking about Jesus and what he might be asking you to do in, in your local church community. Yeah, it was, you know, it was great having you on today and I look Thanks, forward man. to doing it again sometime in the future and just catching up personally in person as soon as possible. So yeah, for looking sure. forward to that. Thanks buddy. Anyways. Peace. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts, or you can find out more at glasscanvas.io. We're so grateful that you could be with us today, and we're looking forward to catching you on the next episode.